I hope my creative title just pulled you in, right? And it's a very pretty picture. So just a quick intro. I work for Onnet down in Cape Town. I head up DevOps. We run most of the local publications, which I'm not going to name, but come talk to me afterwards. We can get juicy. Uh, I'm also a Google developer expert for the region. So the idea is that I have, I'm serve as resources for any Google products. So if you have any questions or feedback, anything related to the Google Cloud, please hit me up. I probably won't be able to answer you, but I can redirect you to people that can, which is good. Uh, also just recently launched atomcert.com, which is it's going out next week. So if you're interested in SSL certificates, please let me know what you think. So very quick intro, but this talk. So I just want to talk about my vision of DevOps. So what I see and how you need to build it out to actually be effective the nature of the news industry. I don't know how many of you actually run news sites. It's quite an other game. Introducing Bob, you'll get to know Bob quite intimately. And just our general setup and workflow and how we're using Python open source tools to run all of this. So I just want to start off by, I'm so used to what I call the blame culture and this to me is one of the main enemies of any <laughs> DevOps team. You need to actually be able to have people feel free to make changes and just try to innovate and continue moving forward without feeling like they're gonna be the one singled out because errors do happen. It's computers, it's servers. It's just you need to learn from it and move on. You can't have someone hanging up because they're the one that took something down. And to move with that, I just wanna, this is very important to me. I feel you need to humanize your infrastructure. You need to make it relatable. You need to actually be able to refer to the infrastructure as a separate entity. So you can blame the infrastructure. You can say, ah, oh, the infrastructure is doing very good today. So this allows you to then be more proactive against reactive. Is the infrastructure is a living entity. It's telling you what it needs. You just use it and relate to it, and if something's wrong, it'll tell you, you'll react to it, and all good before the client finds out, right? <laughs> so just quickly on news, this is quite an interesting field. Uh, it tends to happen in spurts of traffic, so the Monday might not be as much traffic as Tuesday, and you might not even know traffic's coming your way. There are alerts that are sent out. So if a big article's coming up that they know is gonna be popular, you have a semi-alert. But the problem is with Facebook and social media, you never quite know what's going to go viral. And you need to actually just be handle traffic coming in your way. So just a quick example, uh, this Monday actually, I started off the day of this. And that's just, it's normal news site just running. And I love how much mobile is being used. That's a good sign, right? So then, normal page, yeah, you think of images and a little bit of JavaScript. See, I'm tilde. So most of the pages images, they ha love to have highlight images on top of everything, right? So all of a sudden, news happens. Who gets that, please? So this happens. So from 11 to 12, we go from 1,500 sessions to 11,000. There's, you get an alert because your server starts screaming, and then we just react, but no one told us this is happening. This is just a story that got picked up, and we had to handle this. But what's nice is if you read online news, you're probably returning to a resource. So a lot of our traffic is returning visitors. So 20%, this is from the last two weeks, on new visitors. What makes it nice then is our page request goes down quite a bit. So if you're actually using caching and all that, it's much better than a whole free mix, which shouldn't be free mix actually. Uh, but the problem is doing this for 50 plus sites. So we're running most of the local news publications, which is 
quite a challenge. This is where I tried to make it relatable. So the first thing I did when I came in was implement Bob. Bob the Builder. He's our bot. He's the heart of the infrastructure. He's the one that connects us to it and the entire team to what the servers are doing. So what I mean by this is Bob uh, keeps us updated, DevOps team, but also keeps the entire team updated. So he does random, this is talk taking of what we're running, this is how much traffic we're doing, just because the whole team then feels included and everyone's just working to a singular goal because that's what a company does. So an example of this is it does a few basic checks like is that backup? And when it goes down, and you can see it's very condescending. Uh, just in the general chat room, every now and then, how many servers are we running? How much traffic are we doing? The entire team just loves having this feel of we're working towards one goal. We're doing separate tasks to get there. But this is where we're at. Uh, it also does a lot of notifications. So when I say heart of the servers, it's actually running on the servers, checking the server. So Bob is a disconjoined entity that all the servers make up and it lets us know if anything's wrong. For instance, if a server's using all of its RAM for some reason, we need to go check it out. If its hard drive is filling up, that happens more often than I like to admit. He also just grabs status feeds from all our providers we're using, so it keeps us updated so the team can react. What's nice is Bob is after hours too, so he knows business hours are between X and X, so he gives us notifications in chat rooms that it knows we're gonna be up. If not, after hours it sends SMSs, it sends emails to the relevant members and escalates so if something goes wrong, my phone is peeping. <laughs> then what it also does is for our clients, weekly we send out a stats mail. That's from Bob. That's the site it's monitoring and just keeps them in the loop. So just how many times websites are visited and tablet, phones, desktop. Just a quick mile and everybody is feeling included. They know where they're at and they know what they're working towards. This also allows the client to do st some statistics themselves. We also do a lot of invoicing per client, which Bob handles too. So it knows according to the service setup what the client, what client's running in that cluster, sets up an invoice for them and just keeps them updated. That's the entire point. And he's also now, as you can imagine, part of the development workflow. So he's our conduit, you can see I'm referring to him with he, to our servers. So he lets us know what's wrong and he lets us talk to the servers. So that, that's nice, that's quick intro to Bob, I hope you like him. But what Bob is actually made of is a couple of services, mostly Ansible. Ansible handles all the deployments. So we're pushing up servers with Ansible that has Bob ingrained in it and all the monitoring. Uh, what, oh, clicked the wrong button. So I'm gonna be covering this tomorrow in the tutorial. So if you wanna learn Ansible, it's very nice. It's push-based, not pull-based. So please join me. Uh, it then uses Monit, and I don't know if you know Monit running on each server and what Monit allows it to do is actually just tells Bob to tell us if something restarts and handles a restart. It monitors. So if a server is using too much hard, sp hard space, memory, all of that. And just general notifications. So if someone logs in, if some service went down and back up, Bob will be the one telling us, but Monit is the one supplying the information. Along with that, Moonen, I hope you know it. Uh, it's great for train spotting. So if you've got quite a few servers and they're not behaving as they should, fire up Moonen, you can see IO traffic went up, IO traffic went down, more connections than normal, do we need another server? And I don't even know Sentry. I'm actually misusing it. <laughs> 
I'm piping in all our error logs in from the apps, from the actual server. So that would be Nginx supporting back. But what it allows us to do is get trends on a per client basis with per, and also per cluster of any errors we're getting and it gets grouped. So you can see X error happened last night 10 o'clock but again this morning and how many times since then. Uh, yeah. And centralized of course. And just while I'm here, <laughs> I use Mo a lot to write docs and especially if we're dealing with servers, <laughs> I want to get this point across, docs, 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 should sure, repeat it. You need to be able to just give everyone on team be able to read the doc, pick it up and run with it. I'm harsh on this. So that's nice, but what's the infrastructure, right? So that's Python, Bob, controlling it all and just giving us notifications and we're working with him. But the servers themselves are all grouped into what I call clusters. So these are per client setups and behind the load balancer. So that's normal grouping per client that allows us to do the billing and the invoicing per client. And the ever important naming of a server, I don't know if you can actually read that. So what we did is, I don't know what you do, just for fun. So from this name, I can see it's running in the UK. It's for a specific client. What type of server it is and number X of that server. This is just what we're using. If you've got better naming schemas, please tell me. I'd love to hear them. But that allows the grouping from scripts and APIs and we can run Bob against these stuff to generate stats and it's quite nice. So a cluster would be normal database servers, load balancer, file servers, and web servers. And web servers are the only variable in a cluster, actually. It's database servers are quite constant. You don't want to provision, take down database servers all the time. File servers too. Web servers are the one when traffic's coming in, provision like 10 more. Just to handle traffic, provision down. And Ansible is what's handling that. So it can set up new server in a minute or two configure and arrange run, and we can do about 10 concurrently. That's after 10, the connection start dropping off a bit. So who, this is gonna get me in trouble. <laughs> Each of these servers run PHP. I'm controlling them with Python, you see. <laughs> so it's cool. Uh, yeah, and just varnish. It's a lot of caching, because it's news, it's content. And Gluster, I don't know if you know Gluster. It does replicating and sharding of file servers that you can just mount. So we're running a separate set of servers that handle just file. And you can mount them and it's replicated and sharded across a few of them, which is quite nice. So I'm running towards the finish line. So deployment, the actual process we've got with Bob, what makes this interesting is You've got this server setup where the only thing we're actually deploying to is web servers and we're handling database migrations on a separate set. And I've been burned by server state. So the idea with Ansible is to get your server up to a certain state that you wish to have it at. So you'd run Ansible and it would change what needs to be changed and just leave alone what's right. But when you're doing this on live servers and something goes wrong, like it inevitably will, on a, a connection or just drops, you've got half a config on a server somewhere and it just bombs. Which, uh, there's probably ways to get around it, but what we eventually ended up doing is I have what I call preview servers. So they're connected to live, but they're not serving live. And they've got read-only access. So you can just check if new servers coming up already. And we can do some testing in the back end and just make sure that the client doesn't see anything wrong. So it goes from local dev, which is Vagrant, right? I hope you're using Vagrant. That can actually run Ansible. So what makes this so cool is it's running the same script that deployment uh, live servers are running. 
So you're getting the same setup, so works on my machine is pretty much eliminated at this stage. So a new developer comes in, he runs Vagrant up, and he gets developing, which is, I love it. We have the normal testing servers, you need to actually just break something to fix it, right? And that would then go to testing, and when we're happy with that, push it up to a preview server so we can look at it internally. Once that gets red flagged, we essentially do a server-wide test. So we just check all the apps on the server. That's Bob doing it just before going live. And we also prime the cache. I don't know if most of you have considered this, but you can actually get ready for traffic coming in by doing a recursive crawl of, say, like the four links from the home page, just to get ready for anything coming in. And then we switch. So what essentially happens is we switch it on a load balancer, and in a minute or two it takes effect, and then new servers are serving without any downtime, as it's just new servers taking over. And what this gives us as a set of backup servers. So in the case that something really got through all of this, we can just switch back and errors happen. It's, it's fine and Bob will tell us pretty quickly. And that's the point. It's infrastructure that's working with you. So you can do some cool stuff. So that's my very quick talk. So tomorrow, if you want to join me, I'm doing Ansible on Google Cloud just showing you the ins and outs of Google Cloud and just how to actually do your own deployment of Ansible. We're going to do some cool Python stuff. Thank you. Thanks very much, Johan. Um, we're going to be taking some questions. We keep the production servers. We keep them around for an hour or so. That's what we would call our backup in case of total meltdown. Uh, yeah, but it keeps around for an hour, and then after we're happy and we haven't had any complaints and Bob hasn't given us any indications, we take them down. Okay. Hi, just cool. I was just wondering what, um, what type of spin-up time you managed to achieve. It started very slow. <laughs> the first round was about 10 minutes, which is it's still better than an hour from manually setting up, but it's, it's long. But at this moment, we're actually doing about a minute. So it takes us about a minute to get a new server up and running and just do the prime, and then we can just put it out to live. That is impressive. Is that you are using images or...? Uh, yeah, it's a base images, and then yeah. Ansible just handles upgrading and updating and copying of the yeah. code. That's, that's it. Cool, thanks. I've got a question. When you do database migrations on, I presume it was News24 that you were showing off with, um, <clears throat> what's your strategy? How do you lock it? What do you do? Do you put it into read-only mode? Do you do rolling? Do you roll back if things go wrong? How do you do it? Yeah, I kind of like my backups. <laughs> so what we do is we normally communicate with the news team just to give us, we're doing big changes, which they normally send our way, and tell them just to give us a freeze of, say, an hour or two. So we can actually just take this live, make a clone of the database, have it serving, and if anything's wrong, we just fall back. But yeah, that's as far as we've gotten into it. <laughs> My way. So, two questions. Um, firstly, in your PHP environment, are you doing FPM-based runtime for that? And yeah. are you? Why are you keeping Engine X around as well while you do Varnish? Why the middle? I, why the I middle, really, Damon? I really had no idea it could run without. <laughs> Make FPM listen on a like port and just. Like it's an extra piece that you've got in your system. That's piece. just why I was curious. Um, then the second thing was, what is your like? Why do you even bother priming the cache? Why why does your cache take that long to populate? A lot of these sites are okay. This is where on camera, right? Is not 
it's badly built, <laughs> I'm going to be honest. Uh, they use a lot of memory and CPU just to render one page, and they're pulling huge images. So it just helps us settle that initial load coming in of traffic. It's, it comes in in batches of, say, like 1,000, 2,000 when news starts going out. So it's just to handle their initial onslaught. And your images and stuff, are you serving that from your web nodes as well? No kind of like internal CDN, CDN edge? CDN's on the roadmap now, yeah. Okay. And there, uh, sorry, just the one last question is, are all of these things on the Google Cloud, no servers here in South Africa or any other physical servers you maintain yourself? We had local servers, but no, it's all cloud. Yeah. Okay. Any performance issues that you find, IOPS? Just don't go to Texas. <laughs> The round trip isn't bad. <laughs> thanks, JP. Anyone else? Nope. In that case, thanks very much, Johan, for your talk. Thank you.